What does it mean to be male? And then next week we get to talk about femininity. What does it mean to be female? And I'm not going to come to you with a bunch of uh, psychological, sociological data and research, though there will be a little bit. I'm going to come to you with a, a, a biblical framework because God is not silent on these topics. He wants us to know what, what being male means. He wants us to know what being female means. Uh, two weeks from today, we get to talk about human sexuality, which is an important part of this conversation. And we will touch on that briefly today and next week. And parents, just FYI, today, next week, and of course, two weeks from today, will contain subject matter that you may not feel comfortable having your young ones listen to. We will tackle it with reverence and respect, but we also need to be honest with some of these topics in uh, light of our cultural uh, battles and debates and conversations that we need to address these things. And too often the church has been silent on important topics. And I'm one of those kind of pastors. I'm like a, I'm like a bulldog. I, I want to tackle these things head on. I'm not afraid to deal with them. And so sometimes that means getting, getting a little bit in the muck and the mire and the dirtiness of it all. And so I will do as best as I can to keep this PG-13. We may border into our territory. I'm not sure, but just pray for us if you would. So what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be male? If you look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, 27, we, we were in this last week and we looked at how God created man in his image according to his likeness. Two thoughts there the essence of, of, of man and the function of man. That's, there's a difference between image and likeness. Image is essence. Likeness is function. He creates man. And as he creates man, he creates man in two forms, male and female, verse 27. And I think it's important for us to understand that there's a differentiation between these, these two individuals that God has created. If God wanted to lump everyone into one big category, we just called it man, but he separated the two. Male and female, different expressions of humankind. Today we will deal with the topic of masculinity. As one article stated, I read recently, it was titled, The Sorry Lives and Confusing Times of Today's Young Men. So you know where this article is going to go, right? Right? And it said they don't have jobs, they're dropping out of college, they play video games all day, watch porn all night, even their sperm counts are low. Why won't guys grow up? And I'm going to tell you right now, that is the sentiment of a lot of people. As a matter of fact, a, a recent picture was um, posted of the de-evolution of man. Now you've probably seen the evolution of man pictures. Here's the de-evolution of man and, and what man has become. And I think this is a very appropriate picture of what maybe guys were like 80 to 100 years ago in wartime business. And now you have these men that I will call adult adolescents who have not yet learned to grow up, have not let, learned how to, to function responsibly in today's culture. Sociologists cite five markers or milestones that are traditionally associated with maturity into adulthood. Number one, they finish school. Number two, they move away from their parents' house. Number three, they become financially stable or independent. Number four, they get married. And number five, they have children. These are the cultural markers that I think some of us assume are the goals. And I'm going to tell you right now, those are not the goals. But I do think they are healthy mar markers to talk about. 1960, so a while back, 65% of men had ticked off all five of those things I just mentioned by the age of 30. Year 2000, only a third. So the number in 40 years had dropped considerably. By 1970, 69% of 25 year olds and 85% of 30 year olds were married. By year 2000, 33%, down from 69% of 25-year-olds were married, and 58% of 30-year-olds were married. That's a drop from 85%. And I'm sure we can go through all sorts of studies and research and data and say, why are these men not ticking off these, these mile markers that we have associated with, with maturity in the manhood? Why aren't men going to get married more often and more frequently like they used to. And we can probably chalk it up to the households they were raised in. They didn't see mom and dad getting along well. And they're like, I don't want to have any part of that. 
they don't feel like they're adequately equipped or, or gifted or talented to, to be in a marital context. Who knows what the explanation is? But all I know is that God has given us a road map when it comes to what it means to be a man, what it means to, uh, to, to grow in masculinity. And I bet you didn't know this, but in the Bible, there are six words for male and six words that are associated with the stages of maturity into manhood. And so often we just kind of use this generic term man or generic term male, and God is more precise than that. And what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at six stages of biblical manhood. And if we understand these stages from God's perspective, I believe I'm giving you guys a roadmap. Here's the good news. It's never too late to start doing what's right. No matter what we've done in our past, no matter what has been done to us, no matter what mistakes we've made, we have today and God is positioning us for a greater future. And I'm watching the men's giant slalom last night because what else is there to do on a Saturday night, amen? I'm watching the men's giant slalom last night and within five minutes, I see two guys right before the finish line wipe out. And I'm sitting there going, what an apt metaphor for our cultural situation where men, women, start off well. They spend years and years and years training, investing in things that they're passionate about and they don't know how to finish well. And I have a responsibility as a pastor. You can call me a spiritual brother or spiritual father. I have a responsibility to say, I want you to finish well. I want you to fight the good fight. I want you to run the race. I want you to do these things passionately and urgently with endurance. And I would be remiss in not encouraging you as the church in these areas. It does matter how you finish. We all have rough beginnings and we all have rough in-betweens, but what really matters is the end is how well you finish. And I want you just like you want me to finish well. And so this morning, there's going to be some training. There's going to be some equipping. God wants you to win at this race we call life. And as men, he gives us direction. And I want you to know too that, you know, years ago, there was a book on masculinity that came out called Wild at Heart. And it took off like crazy. And, you know, there were some interesting things in it. But I, I cautioned guys back then, just like I caution guys today, because what the author put forth is that you are masculine by how many times you go camping. And you are masculine by how well you change the oil in your car. And all those things we tend to associate with, with male things. And I'm sitting there going, but we are men even if we don't do those things. Can I tell you how much I am quote unquote shamed by certain people I know that can take a car apart with their bare hands, strip it down to nothing and rebuild it. And I'm like, I have a tough time with Batman Legos with my kids and following the instructions. Does that make me less of a man? Cause I don't know how to change my oil. See, we live in a society that looks at the, that the physical strength. So what if I don't, you know, look like Vin Diesel, if I don't look like Vin Diesel, am I less than a man? Check out this slide. Research has recently been done that, you know what? Guys just aren't having the physical strength like their fathers had. See, back in 1985, men on average had a grip strength of 117 pounds. Today, it has dropped to 98 pounds. Men are growing physically weaker, but does that mean that they are no longer masculine or male? They measure grip strength. They mention, they mention pinch strength. But is it also a reflection of our culture where we're no longer doing heavy, laborious jobs? More and more guys are working at desks in cubicles and doing things that aren't necessarily physically exerting. But just because I'm not working in the coal mine, does that make me not a, not a man? Just because I'm not working on the car, just because I don't know how to change a light bulb, whatever. I do know how to change a light bulb. <laughs> I've changed a few light bulbs in my day. See, I, I do know the culture knows what men shouldn't be. I do know from this past week that a man should not go to a high school and kill 17 people. I do know that a man shouldn't take advantage of women 
and become a guy like Harvey Weinstein. See, culture's great about saying, that's not a man. Those are monsters. Those are evil people. But, but what is a man? And what we have to understand is God says a man is different than a woman. And he's different than a woman in so many ways that the culture doesn't even have an idea or clue in, in understanding. And that's why we're tackling this topic today. The first stage we have to start at is creational male. And we've already looked at this. Creational male, two things are important to understand. We possess creational greatness, but we also possess extreme fallenness. See, what we have to understand, we've talked about this last week, this is a stage in the journey of life that we share with our feminine counterpart. This is the only stage we share with our feminine counterpart. That you are created with creational greatness, meaning you have been designed for relationships. You have been designed for relationships with, with the opposite sex. You've been designed for relationships with the same sex. You've been designed for a relationship with the creator, the sovereign God overall. You have been uniquely wired for relationship unlike anything else in creation. That makes you great. You have been created with intrinsic worth and dignity. You have been created as that set apart from the rest of creation when God says in Psalm 8, you are the apex, the crowning achievement of what I have created. And that's why the psalmist says, what, what am I that you should think so highly of me? See, you have been created. Every man, woman born in this world is created with dignity and worth. But you're also built with mortality. You are not God. You are a mortal creature that will live for eternity. But we also have to understand that we have limitations. And yet, sometimes man, woman struggles with these limitations. And we're going to talk about how that makes itself apparent in the, in the, in the points to come. And you are created with this capability of, of righteousness, to do righteous things that reflect the character and nature of God. But also, too, you also are created with the capacity for unrighteousness, which brings up this topic of extreme fallenness. Aren't you amazed at the great things man can do? And aren't you amazed at the horrible things man can do? I'm going to probably reference a lot of movies. I'm sorry. Powerful movie this year, tough movie, and I, an extreme R-rated movie. Three billboards outside Ebbing's, Missouri. Who's seen it? Raise your hand. Here's, see, I mentioned movies, and I shouldn't even ask who's seen it, because I'm, I'm going, there's one, two hands, maybe. Uh, this one may be the Oscar runaway this year for, for awards. But what this movie shows you, and my wife and I were talking about the, the greatness of what it means to be human and the, and the depraved, depraved condition of what it means to be human. And it's the whole spectrum. You're frustrated, you're laughing, you're crying, you're mad. I mean, it just, but it's the best of humanity and it's the worst of humanity. It's, it's like the, 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 the German Nazi colonel who in the middle of the concentration camp where there are gas chambers and there are Jewish men, women being killed, being slaughtered. And in the middle of the concentration camp is a white picket fence with a grass in yard and a house that he goes home to every day, hangs his coat on the hanger, gets to have dinner with his kids, has a piano with Bach up on the piano in the midst of this horrible, tragic situation. This is the disparity. There is creational greatness, but yet there's extreme fallenness. And we have to realize and wrestle with these things. That man has the capability to do amazing things and that man has the amazing ability to do horrible things. Can I, I'm going to give you with each of these stages a, a biblical character that I think best represents these. Solomon, King Solomon. Started out, Book of Kings, First Kings, 
Solomon, ask for anything in the world, I'll give it to you. Let me have wisdom to honor you and do good to people. God said, because you asked for that, and you didn't ask for wealth or riches or this, I'm going to give it to you. And not only am I going to give you wisdom, but I'm also going to give you wealth and riches and all that. And yet through Solomon's life, here's what you see. Just incredible creational greatness. But did you know his heart began to drift from God as he became richer and more powerful? He began to fall in love with women who didn't worship the same God he worshiped. He started following after other gods and he finishes his life by sacrificing his own children to a foreign god. Solomon, poster child for creational greatness and extreme fallenness. Now, how do we as men and women differ? differ? Point number two, stage number two. Sexual male. Sexual male. Edgar Allan Poe, famous writer in The Raven, makes this statement, the passions should be held in reverence. Sexuality is a beautiful thing. Sexuality is a God-given, perfectly designed thing that he has given to us to enjoy. The problem with sexual male is we don't understand the parameters in which our sexuality should be experienced and explored. And we're going to talk more at length about this here in the future. But number one point is this. The Bible firmly roots male identity and sexuality in anatomy, not physiology or psychology or sociology. Right? The doctor announces, you have given birth to a baby boy. How does he know that? Has he asked the child his feelings on his gender? Smack, smack on the bottom. Do you feel like a boy or a girl today? All the doctor has to do is go, between the legs, outer plumbing, inner plumbing, boy or girl. And yet we live in a culture that says, modern psychology says, you are male if you feel like one. Oh, the feelings are so powerful, aren't they? We're going to really unpack that in two weeks. Sociology says you're a male if you do the kind of things that are given culture says a male should do to be considered male. Can I just tell you right now, I am a male, whether I feel like it or not, whether I ever do anything considered masculine by the culture in which I'm living. And I have to accept that. And I have to live out of that part of my identity. I can't repress it. I can't hide it. I can't disguise it. I can't call it something else. And, And this is why this is important. And this is a point we don't understand. Our sexuality is tied to our spirituality. We cannot separate those two things. There's a reason God has designed this the way he has. And there's a reason why even in the beginning, God separated his people, Israel, and says, here's how you're going to be distinct for the other, uh, the other nations. What's the physical thing God said for the, the nation to do in order to set them apart? Circumcision out. I kind of double over when I say that word. Imagine being the recipient of the message and saying, now you got to go out and circumcise all the men in, in, in the nation. I mean, who's the first to line up for that? And yet, here is the mark of how spiritually you're going to be different. We are going to circumcise you. Your thought, why did God choose this means? Well, there's a reason why he ordains the people to sacrifice the way he does. You bring a male goat. You bring a female turtle. Even in their prescribed worship, there's differentiation even in the sexes of the animals. But when it comes to man, he basically says, every time you drop your drawers, you need to be reminded of who you are. You're mine. And especially if you think you're going to sleep with foreign women who don't practice the art of circumcision with their males, and you think you're going to commit unfaithfulness to your wife, as soon as you drop your pants, she's going to know something different about you. What's going on there, right? You know, she's scratching her head going, what happened? And yet it is a mark of differentiation where God says, I want you to understand your sexuality is tied to who you are spiritually. See, we should not shy away from these themes. We should not shy away from these topics. We must learn how to honor God with our sexuality in the context of the restraints which he has prescribed. The primary purpose of 
our sexuality is affirmed only, only through a relationship with the feminine counterpart in the institution of marriage. That is it. Whether I feel like that or not, whether I really desire that or not, it doesn't matter. This is what God has ordained. There's a lot of things God has ordained that I don't like, but I must understand I must yield to a greater authority and power. So let me say it again. We'll unpack this more in two weeks. Primary purpose of my sexuality as a man as a man, is to be affirmed only through a relationship with a feminine counterpart in institution of marriage. Her name is Lori. And that is in the context in which God says, only in this context should you experience what it means to be a sexual male. Amen? And yet we live in a culture that certainly doesn't want to hurt your feelings, doesn't want to den deny those deepest desires and those yearnings. This is why uh, pornography perhaps is, is off the charts when it comes to a sickness in our culture. I mean, I remember being exposed to pornography at a very young age. Came across uh, a magazine material my dad had and inadvertently stumbled upon it. And that began a very vicious cycle in my world. So much so that uh, in high school, experience with some other friends, some really, really hardcore stuff that it's taken years for God to just wash out of my mind and my heart. But you know why pornography is so rampant? Not just among men, but among women, but especially among men. Because there is a deep-seated fantasy for a man to be loved and appreciated by as many women as he can, and here's the problem with pornography, without the fear of risk or rejection. See, this is why pornography tackles and destroys the deepest part of our psychology as men. We think we have control over this because now I can guard my heart, my emotions. I won't have to risk rejection. And the real problem is we think we're controlling it when in reality it's starting to control us. And any sexuality that controls you and you don't have a mastery over it is a sexuality that you need healing from God in. And this, and no matter where you've been or what you've done, I want you to know there's healing. And there's things you can do. I have men who have willingly signed up to send me reports of things they're looking at online from their computers. See, back in the day before there were computers, you had to put on an overcoat and a hat and dark sunglasses and walk in these places that you, didn't, you, didn't, you shouldn't be walking into. But now the ease of accessibility of this stuff is now affecting generations and it's affecting these younger generations of what these kids are exposed to with no parental oversight whatsoever and it's damaging them. And I'm going to tell you right now, you guys, we need to hold each other accountable in these things. If, if this is an area you struggle with, I want you to know you're in a good place in, in, in being able to reach out and say, I need help. I need encouragement. See, back in the day, I had guys bring me stuff. And at the church where I was a college pastor 20 plus years ago, there was this field in the back. And we used to go burn videotapes and magazines. There was, there was like fire in the back. And the secretaries at the church were always thinking like, oh, great, Scott's burning porn out in the backfield again, right? This was a Baptist church. And, we were, and there were college guys that this, this was something that was controlling their hearts. And we were willing to make steps and do extreme things to see them be freed of this. And I want you to know, God is able to free you from these things. See, sexuality is a beautiful thing only when it is experienced in its proper context. Two things you need to write down when it comes to sex. Pleasure and procreation. God's given it to us for those things. Pleasure and procreation. It is, is meant to be enjoyed. And number one, it's meant to make babies. Multiply, right? Multiply. Make babies fill the world. Who's the character that we can associate with this? Samson. Ah, oh, Samson, who couldn't control his phallus, right? He hated the Philistines so much, but he liked the ladies. So much so, with one woman, he was willing to reveal his inner, inner part of who he was, his weakness. 
And in order to have her sexually, he revealed to her the secret of his strength. And we know the narrative. She cuts his hair and he loses his strength, right? All for the sake of pleasure with a foreign woman. Samson is the role model for uncontrolled sexuality, though we could probably list more. Amen? But we're not going to. All right, number three, warrior male. So we're moving through these paths. So creational male, the only stage we share with our feminine counterpart. Uh, number two, sexuality. This is where it becomes a different journey. Even though sexual experience is, is the same, why we seek certain things in sex is, is different. We'll talk about that in two weeks. Number three, warrior male. The fact that we are born, men are born with this innate sense to fight. I can't tell you how many times I'm roughing battles between my two boys, 9 and 11 years old. It is a constant struggle in competition. It is a constant struggle of saying who's one up and who's one down and how are we going to change the order of these things. And it is no more apparent than within boys. This is not saying women are not uh, warriors or fighters, but I'm going to tell you men have been wired with this innate sense to fight competition, win the game of life, and be proud of the victories that you have won. The glory of the young man is their strength. And there's nothing wrong with a fighter inside a, inside a male. We want fighters. And so the warrior epitomizes the, the noblest qualities of bravery and sacrifice and stamina. For the warrior, point number one in your notes, life is a contest. A struggle to preserve independence and avoid failure. And this is exactly how men operate. I mean, when men meet another man, there's an immediate sizing up of the other person. You know, is it Vin Diesel versus Pee Wee Herman or is it Vin Diesel versus The Rock? You know, what, what's going on here? And, and it could be job related, it could be car related, it could be girl related, right? I'm at the Phoenix, uh, the Waste Management Open with my wife and a lot of fake people at the, at the Waste Management Open. My wife leans to me and goes, how many of these people here actually know anything about golf? And I said, probably less than 25%. And it's all about image, right? You got the guys looking like they just came off Jersey Shore. You got the ladies looking like they came off some sort of avenue, downtown, whatever. And, you know, they're all walking around and you're sitting there going, wow. And, you know, the guys are sitting there going, look at the trophy. Look at who I got, right? And they're sizing one another up. It's the warrior in them. And I'm making general stereotypes. I'm sorry if you're from New Jersey or wherever. So, But a male warrior is characterized by strength by competing to be superior in order to gain significance. And it's the warrior that allows men to endure. It's this quality that allows them to persevere even in the most adverse of circumstances. But I want you to frame this in a, in a bigger context. Number one, do you know God is a warrior? The term used for men being warriors is also a term that's associated with God as a warrior. Matter of fact, write down these verses, Jeremiah 10. Verse 6, Lord, there is no one like you, for you are a warrior and your name is full of power. Think of the Psalm, Psalm 89, verse 13. Powerful is your arm, strong or warrior-like is your hand. Your right hand is lifted in glorious strength. Your throne is founded on two strong pillars, righteousness and justice, unfailing love and truth walk before you as attendants. And why is this important? Because for the Jewish mindset, they know their God is a warrior because he's the one that caused the Passover to happen in Egypt and to deliver his people, to lead them, and ultimately separate the Red Sea to be delivered from their enemies. And I'm going to ask you right now, how many weapons did Israel have in their, in their arsenal? Zero. Because God fought for his people. God is a warrior. And he fights for us. And perhaps there's no greater fighting for us than what was displayed through Jesus, who is the messianic warrior, right? At the cross. Aren't you glad Christ went through this, this pathway of self-sacrifice and doing for you what you can never do for yourselves because he didn't need to do it, but he wanted to do it. And to prove himself a warrior on your behalf. This is why in Isaiah 9, Famous passage we look at around Christmas time, right? It says, a child is born to us, a son is given. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. Warrior. So again, warrior 
is not something to, to discipline inside a, a, a young boy or, or a man. A warrior is something that we need to draw out because this is a God-given design. It, it reflects God in his nature, what Jesus has done for us. But here's the key. It's knowing what or who it is we serve. And more importantly, the God-honoring warrior in your notes must know what to fight for and know when to quit. This is the problem. Most men don't know what they're fighting for and they don't know when to quit when they should be stopping. See, in our culture, you would think being the warrior is the goal of manhood. It's not. This is an important journey along the way. It is an important one to understand, but this is not the goal of manhood. The goal of manhood is to serve the higher values of a king who has fought for us, and in turn now we fight for him. This is why when things happen like they do in Florida, we should sit there and go, where are the people, the men, the boys that are going to step up and learn to take responsibility for our culture and for our communities? See, God has wired it so that men understand I have a responsibility to make sure my context in which I live is better because I'm here. And I'm serving higher values. I will lead. I will protect. I will provide. But if those things aren't taught and really built up within a young boy's heart, they won't know how to respond to things like this. See, the spiritual warrior is the warrior who trusts and finds his refuge in God rather than his own strength or material possessions. You're not strong by how much money is in your bank account. You're not strong by how, much, how many pounds you can bench press. You're not strong by how many women you can sleep with. You are strong when you know the Lord your God. Check out Psalm 147 this week. Write this down. Psalm 147 verse 10. The strength of a horse does not impress God. How puny in his sight is the strength of a man. Rather, listen, the Lord's delight is in those who honor him, those who put their hope in his, in his unfailing love. See, your money, your possessions, your girls, your cars, whatever you want, does not impress God. What is God moved by? The person that loves him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Check out this verse. Jeremiah 9, I love this one. I gave this one to Jacob a few weeks ago, and he was, yeah, he's been chewing on it. It's been good. Check this out. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man, the warrior man, boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, God says, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. For in there, these things I delight, declares the Lord. Whole lot different journey in being masculine than what our culture teaches us, isn't it? What God values and what our culture values are diametrically opposed to each other. Because to be a warrior is clearly defined by our God, specifically in the verse we just read. So the warrior does not trust his own abilities, but he trusts the Lord his God. Who is... A biblical poster child for this? King David. But notice the trajectory of his life. He was the one who, who heard the uncircumcised Philistine Goliath saying, your God is dead. Your God is worthless. Your God does, is insignificant. And David sitting back there as a young shepherd, right? He just got off the fields from killing lions and shepherding sheep and all that stuff. And he's like, who's going to let this guy continue to run his mouth? And he borrows armor that doesn't even fit him, and he goes and he slays Goliath. Ah, people rejoice, right? Here's a man who in his warriorness tackles an enemy of God. So much so, uses his own soul, sword, lops off his head. Some of those moments that we as men go, yeah! freedom, right? You know, all that cool stuff. But then you look at the trajectory of, of David's life. He allows power and strength to go to his head. He becomes king, sees a woman bathing, wants her, doesn't care if she's married, sleeps with her, she becomes pregnant, 
And then the moment he should be a man and, and tell her husband he doesn't, he sends him off to the front lines, he dies. He's committed adultery. He's committed murder. The prophet Nathan confronts him, right, with a story, and he gets all mad, and he says to David, you are the man in the story. You're guilty. And yet we see the choices of this man, poor choices affect his own household, affect his leadership. And at the end of 2 Samuel, probably one of the saddest moments, David says, I want you to take account of my army. And the report comes back to David. You have 1.2 million men in your army. And God comes to David and says, shame on you for counting how strong your army is because you've lost sight of how strong your God is. I will never be supplanted by your strength your military presence, David, you have lost sight of a God who fights on behalf of you. I don't want you glorying in your strength. I don't want you reveling in your spiritual or your, your mighty men and power. I want you to revel in me, David. And because you've done this thing that I consider a sin, your desire to build the temple will not happen by you. I'm going to give that credit and pleasure to your son, Solomon. And so God takes what David so earnestly wanted to do and says, because of your sin and your eyes are not on me, I will give that ability to build the temple to your son, Solomon. See, it's knowing what to fight for, knowing when to quit. Fight for the things of the Lord, guys. Do not join the cultural battle. The culture does not know what it's fighting for. Then there comes a moment, you got to quit. You got to say, I'm going to stop. For the betterment of my marriage, for the betterment of my kids, for the betterment of my own soul, I need to stop pursuing these things that will not in eternity amount to anything. Because is that not Maximus' cry in Gladiator? What we do will echo for all eternity. And here's a man who did not want to squander his current opportunities. Amen? See? I just quoted for you like William Wallace and Maximus. I mean, those are two killer dudes, aren't they? But to be a man, you don't necessarily have to fight in the arenas. But you must represent the convictions that these men had. Right? There's a difference. Convictions. This is the warrior. But by being a warrior leads us to our fourth point. What happens when you fight a lot of battles? You get wounded. We as men think we're invincible. We as men do not understand our vulnerabilities. Have you seen the strain of, of memes out there and videos of like why ladies live longer than guys do? And there's guys doing crazy things like jumping off roofs into empty pools and thinking that they're going to survive these st this stuff, right? Here's men who do not understand that they are mortal creatures, but yet when we are wounded, most men don't know how to deal with their woundedness. Patrick Arnold said it this way, to be a man is to bear wounds and to wear scars. For men to discover what manhood is all about, we must process the wounds that happen in our lives. Can I tell you, one of the things I've thought about is I've thought about my own journey as a, as a man. You know, my mom died when I was 15 years old. I was the oldest of three kids. So I was 15, my mom dies. Back in the mid-80s when this happened, there was no one at that time that thought maybe it's a good idea to send you to someone who's able to help you process what you're feeling. And I can't tell you that even though we had a loving church family that provided hot meals for us, there was never a moment where someone came alongside of me for, for several years to say, let's sit down and talk about what you've been through. And yet, I think the lack of processing is common to most men. Whether we lose a loved one, whether we lose a job, whether we go to war, we're, we're injured physically, we're injured you know, mentally or emotionally, whatever we go through as far as our battles, oftentimes there is not the opportunity to process what we've been through. And as men, we need to have that place where we are able to process what we've been through because while we feel like we're invincible, we have trouble accepting our wounds. 
We, it, they don't make sense to us. And yet it's only through wounding that a man becomes aware of who he is as a being created in God's image. And I will tell you, pain is the doorway to manhood. And if we try to avoid it or not talk about it, it doesn't make things worse. And there's, a wonder, there's no wonder why we are dealing with adults who are adolescent in their emotions, in their mentality, in their relationships. I'm going to tell you right now, the Bible honors woundedness as an important stop of the masculine journey. We must learn how to process it, but we are also called not to stay in it. Boy, I remember, you know, uh, the last church we planted and I pastored and boy, things did not end well there. And that's a that's another story for another time. But talk about woundedness trusted loved ones, family, friends who, who, who became traitors in a sense. And, you know, one of the things my wife and I were processing, processing as we were meeting with a counselor, she said to us, you must stay in the crucible. That was something I didn't want to hear. Like, I don't want to stay in that place of pain and hurt. And yet you must stay in it Learn the lessons that that crucible holds for you, but realize that one day you will be leaving the crucible. That place where all that stuff is mixed and mingled and it's the last place you want to be. We must learn that we must stay in the woundedness, process the woundedness, and eventually realize that you will not have to live in it for eternity. Write this point down in your notes. The man without faith merely deals with his woundedness. But the man of faith must wrestle with God over it. You ever wonder how people even manage in this life without God? And yet, perhaps even the tougher thing is to manage this life with God. With all the disappointments and the frustrations, right? Pastoring a church for eight years, putting my heart, soul, blood, sweat, tears into this thing, and then having it taken away, and you're like, what? You better believe I wrestle with God. You better believe I said, what, what have been the, have the last eight years been for? Have you ever felt like that? Like you've invested so much of, of yourself into something and all of a sudden it's taken away. It's destroyed. It's ruined. And you sit there and you can't help but raise a clenched fist to God and say, what? What are you doing? Because my heart wants to believe that God is a benevolent God. But my heart also goes before God and says, right now I really hate you. Because you've done this. And yet, what this pain does is it, may, it, it forces us to confront the most basic condition about us is that it's this. You are not God. Woundedness reminds you, you are mortal. Ted Dobson wrote these words. There is a tear in the masculine soul, a gaping hole or wound that leads to a profound insecurity. Society has torn the soul of the male, and into this tear, demons have fled, demons of insecurity, selfishness, and despair. Consequently, men do not know who they are as men. Rather, they define themselves by what they do, who they know, and what they own. And we wonder why we're dealing with society ills like we're dealing with. Two poster children for this point. Job. Duh. Right? Like, like some of you already go, Job. Job. Read chapter 29, 30 sometime. Chapter 29, Job says, you know what? I was that guy who, boy, the friendship of God was experienced in my house my children were with me. My wife was with me. Boy, my olive groves poured out streams of olive oil. I went to the city gates and I took my place of honor among the elders of the city. The young men stepped aside on the street when they saw me coming. And princes put their hands over their mouth because they heard of my, my righteousness and my renown. He said new honors were continually coming upon me. That's chapter 29. Then chapter 30, hear Job's words. But then I became mocked by those who are younger than I. 
by young men whose fathers are not worthy to run with my sheep dogs. And now their sons mock me with their vul vulgar song. They taunt me and now my heart is broken. Depression haunts my days. I cry to you, O God, but you do not answer me. I stand before you and you do not even bother to look at me. You have become cruel toward me. You persecute me with your great power. That's in the word of God, ladies and gentlemen. Right? These are the honest cries of a man who has been wounded. Children die, house destroyed, possessions taken from him, and even his own wife turns tail. And this is a man who not only experienced physical woundedness, boils all over his body. Anyone ever have boils? Don't raise your hand if you've ever had boils all over your body. I mean, right? The encouragement to him is like, just take pottery, the shards of parchment, and just, just scrape the boils off you. Yeah, that sounds exciting. But think about the spiritual and emotional woundedness. And yet, somehow, some way, there is that verse in Job that says, even though I've gone through so much stuff, thanks babe, I know that my Redeemer lives. Look at David, his psalms. Here's the categories for psalms. Praise, depression. That's, that's it. You read the psalms, you're like, this guy is so bipolar. This guy is so schizophrenic, right? It's either all praise or all depression. And yet, isn't that the honest journey? As we go through life, we, as men, sometimes we... we we prefer isolation. We prefer isolation because we need a place to nurse our woundedness and we don't want anyone to come near to us, not even our wives, not our counselors, not our pastors, not our loved ones. These are people that mean well and good and they deeply care for us, but men do not know how to process, especially in a communal way. We isolate ourselves and we think we know what's good for us. And sometimes we externalize our woundedness with hostility and violence. And I'm going to tell you right now, we need to create environments where men can talk and men can share without being condemned, without being judged, without being shot down. Men need a context in which we can just learn how to be human with each other. And I want to create that environment. That's why God has shown me that it's okay to share my, my weaknesses and my struggles and my vulnerabilities. You know, so often I go before God and I say, what's a good illustration for this point, Lord? He says, your life. The very thing I don't want to let you into, the very thing I don't want to admit, but I try to because I want every man in this room to know that you may be beaten down, but you're not crushed. You may be afflicted, but you're not counted out when it comes to the grace and goodness of our God. That he can work with every, any single one of us, guys. We've all made mistakes, and we will continue to make them, but it's the context in which we live in community. How well are we helping each other out? Instead of shaming, we're helping them up. Instead of putting them down, we're giving my hand up and saying, let's go. Jacob. Genesis 32. Talk about dysfunctional family, right? Parental favoritism. Jacob snows dad for the birthright, right? Esau, the oldest, should have given it. Now all of a sudden there's a hot tail pursuit. Esau hates Jacob. Jacob's running. And yet there's such woundedness that he's living out of. He doesn't know how to process it. So much so, he's so wounded that he thinks he can take on God. See, he's not only wrestling with his family, he wrestles with God. And in chapter 32, he wrestles with the angel. And boy, what a place of woundedness when you think you can take on the Lord. And what does the angel do to Jacob right there in Genesis 32? Bam! Right on the hip. Knocks this thing right out of place. Talk about hip displacement. That could have happened. Sorry. Very visual. Now, those of you who are asleep on that side are now awake. And The angel knocks Jacob's hip out of place as a physical reminder 
that you can never go before God and walk away unchanged. And the angel said, you're going to meet your brother tomorrow. And you're going to be reconciled to him. And can you imagine the scene? Here comes Esau. And here's Jacob. He's a changed man. Right? He gets wounded. He gets beat up. Not only from the self-inflicted stuff, but by the angel of the Lord. And so he is so insecure in his standing before God and his brother that he must prove he can gain the upper hand. And yet he's learned the hardest lesson, right? And he goes before his brother and reconciliation happens because he has now learned what to fight for and know when to quit. And God is able to restore something there. It's what's so powerful about the movie Fight Club, if you've ever seen it. And I tell you what, this, when it came out tw almost 20 years ago, does that make you feel old? Almost 20 years ago. Tyler Durden and crew, yep. Uh, the battle for the masculine soul. That's, that's what that movie's about. What does it mean to be a man? And here these guys growing up in environments where they never had manhood positively modeled for them. And they have to create these underground places where they have to inflict pain with one another because it's only through pain that they feel. Goo goo dolls, you bleed just to know you're alive. Awesome lyrics. It's true. But yet, how much pain, how much bleeding until you just stop and have to process? See, it's wrapping your mind around these things. Why? And the tough part about Job was that he was never told why. And we as men have to accept that we are not God. And I'm going to tell you right now, men do not usually grow past this stage. There are two more stages. But men don't pe grow past this stage. Because stage number five is this, mature man. Elton John in his song, The Last Song, wrote these words, I never thought I'd lose, I only thought I'd win. Right? I mean, that's the, that's the spirit of the, the masculine soul, right? Competitor, invulnerability, I'll never be harmed in life, I'll never get fired from a job, I'll never go through a divorce, I'll never get cancer, I'll never come to a point in my life where I'll view my life as a total disaster. And yet it happens. And maturity springs only from adversity. We go through this stuff in order to grow through it, to mature through it. Through wounding comes healing, and through that healing process, we not only need God, but we need each other. But if man is to mature, he must come out of isolation. He must be invited into an environment where healing can take place. And so the mature man has been resurrected from the wounds of life and has a new perspective on the meaning of life and manhood because of the pain. I love that word resurrected. The phoenix rising from the ashes, right? Whatever picture, whatever analogy you want to use, we must learn that there's opportunities to grow through whatever adverse circumstances we find ourselves in. Am I a different person, husband, dad, man, pastor than I was 10 years ago? You better believe it. And I've really learned what to fight for and what not to fight for. I've really learned about my mortality and the fact that I'm not God and that even though I'm a control freak, there's, there's a greater one who can control than me. And I love how Elton Trueblood says this. He says, men cannot live well either in poverty or in abundance unless they see some meaning and purpose in life alone. Uh, which alone can be thrilling. Lacking the joy which comes from meaning and purpose, we all turn to wretched substitutes. See, the mature man goes, what sort of meaning can I derive from this experience? So for the mature man, there's this new depth and richness that he's never experienced before. He begins to think beyond himself. Why? Because the sexual man is focused on his penis. The warrior man is focused on his strength, his gun, whatever. The wounded man cannot see beyond his own hurt. See, it's all 
self. And all of a sudden the mature man realizes that not only am I going to learn things about myself, but I need to understand how the things I learned myself better my environment. See, this is a sign of maturity. That this man who is mature becomes more responsible with his relationships and his responsibilities. 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Solomon writes these words, I'm going to take, I'm going where everyone on earth must someday go. Take courage and be a man. Right? Act like a man. Observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in obedience to him and keep his decrees and his commandments, his laws and regulations as written in the law of Moses. Do this so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. That's maturity right there. And I said that with Solomon. This is actually David. Yet Solomon at the end of Ecclesiastes, right? Chapter 12, he says, what have I learned in all my days? Fear God and keep his commandments. How about the verse from Psalm chapter 1? Great verse. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of the sinners, nor sits in the sea of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The very first psalm, the very first verse. Let's keep this in proper, proper focus. This is what it's about. Guys, we're going to go through the wilderness. Okay, we're going to go through the wilderness. We're going to have difficult times. But the wilderness represents not only a place of testing, but it also represents a place of tutoring. Let the wilderness teach you. Who is the embodiment of this point? Elijah, the prophet. Remember the prophets, uh, the false prophets of Baal? You know, and Elijah's taunting them like, where's your God? Is he sleeping? Why isn't he doing anything, right? All of a sudden, Elijah begins to fear not just Ahab, but his crazy psycho wife, Jezebel. This is why you don't name your daughter Jezebel. Just saying, there's certain names you put on your baby name list. Don't put Jezebel on there, please. Jezebel was a woman, and listen, hell hath no fury like a woman's scorn. Amen? Elijah hears of Jezebel's anger, and he runs. He ends up being in a cave. In 1 Kings 19, he's in this cave, and God says to him, why are you here, Elijah? And he says, God came to me not in the thunderstorm and not in the lightning and not in all these powerful things in nature, but God came to me with a whisper. And then again, God says to him second time, why are you still here? Meaning, it is time for you to move out of this cave, go do what I've called you to do, Understand the path of maturity that you're not called to live in the cave fearing a woman who's, who's psycho and doesn't know your God. You are called by me who I will fight your battles and you go represent me well. That's growing in maturity. Last one. And I know we're, just so you guys know, these points, this is six separate messages I gave years ago. I'm giving you six messages in one message. Last point, fulfilled, fulfilled male. This is the sage, this is the wise man who grows through woundedness, grows in maturity, understands what God is doing, his responsibilities to, to people, relationships, and, and other fulfilled male. See, this is, again, why God puts this in his word. He says, he says Middle Eastern culture understands the aged or elderly better than the Western culture does. See, in the Middle Eastern mindset, there's no such thing as retirement. There's no such thing as these closed communities where we ship off old people and say, hope you do well dying as you play shuffleboard as you enter into eternity, right? And that, like, that's the end all be all. See, in Middle Eastern culture, the elderly, the old men, the old women were positioned to continue to invest in the lives of the younger people there. There was this thing in the Old Testament called the city gates. And anytime a young man had a question about anything, he knew exactly where to go to get information he needed to do well in life. He'd go to the city gates where the men gathered every day and they were available for counsel. And yet today we have this disease, and literally there's this research has been done. It's called granny dumping. Have you heard about this? 
It refers to the practice of dropping or leaving elderly people at the doorsteps of hospitals and quickly speeding off to leave the nurse and staff to take care of them, figuring out their identity, insurance coverage plans. Dr. Robert Azinger estimates that close to 200,000 senior adults are dumped at hospitals every year. You show me a culture who not only doesn't know how to treat the unborn, but doesn't know how to treat the elderly, and I will show you a culture that will be quickly in demise. There's no respect for those that have lived life longer than us. See, the fulfilled man is not retired, but involved, nurturing, leading, modeling, contributing. This is the goal of manhood. To say that whether I'm in my 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, I still am here in order to give to the generation behind me, two generations behind me, all that I have learned, the ways I have grown. This is the goal of manhood. The goal of manhood is not to have a perfect job. The goal of manhood is not to buy the perfect house. The goal of manhood is not to have a perfect wife or kids. The goal of manhood is to become seasoned in spiritual maturity so that he is able to give back to those that he will one day leave behind because here's the reality, we will all die. And what kind of legacy will you live? leave? See, as a pastor, I have a responsibility not only to show you how to live, but I need to prepare us all for that inevitable day in which we're all going to die. Amen? Don't we like talking about dying? No, we don't. Okay. This is why Deuteronomy 32, Moses says, remember the days long ago about the generations past. Ask your father and he's going to tell you about God. Psalm 37, once I was young, but now I'm old, yet I've never seen the godly forsaken nor seen their children begging for bread. This is why the older generation is important. They will tell you about how good God is. They will tell you about how awesome God is. They will tell you how God provides, how God shows himself powerful. They are there to remind you when you doubt, you get frustrated, you question, where's God? They're there to tell you. We've been around the block a few times, and I'm going to tell you, we had the same questions when we were your, your, we were your age, but I'm going to tell you about God and how faithful he is when he seems absent. See, wisdom, ladies and gentlemen, is not a prerogative of age, but of biblical insight and obedience. David says in Psalm 119, I am wiser than my elders, for I have kept your commandments. Just because you're, you have gray hair doesn't mean you're smart. Just because you have a lot of wrinkles doesn't mean you're wise. God measures wisdom by how well not only do you know the word, but how well you're obedient to the word. This is the goal. For you as men, for me as a man, for all of us to grow old so that we can now give back to the generations behind us because we want them to flourish. We want them to do well. We want them to have strong marriages. Amen. We want them to have godly children. Amen. We want them to have a solid work ethic. Amen. We want them to honor God with their penises just like we're going to honor God with our penises. Amen. Every aspect of who I am is called to be brought into obedience to the Lord, no matter how difficult it is. And till the day I die, I am called to give back to help God's people out, whatever that looks like. Always contributing, always mentoring. I meet with, how old is Wayne? Late 70s. I meet with a mentor, pastor who's been pastoring for a long time. Call him the old sheepdog. And I meet with him, and I tell you what, it is an awesome, awesome time. Every four to six weeks, we meet. And you know what? I think Wayne feels, perhaps maybe, that, that battle of, am I still significant? Am I still important? And I just want to, I want to tell, me about, tell me about when you were pastoring, Wayne. Tell me about the struggles you went through. And there's two questions Wayne always asks me as he's my mentor. What right now, Scott, is, is, is an encouragement to you? And what right now is frustrating to you? Why? Because he wants to help me mature. See, being a mentor is called alongside to help. It's not to ensure, but it's to help. And this is what God's called us all to. Amen? Six stages. Real fast, you guys. Did we get all that? It's like drinking from a fire hydrant, I know. So next week, the stages of biblical femininity. And uh, no better person to speak on femininity than me, your pastor, right? 
I'm sure I'll be leaning on my wife a lot this week. So let's stand, let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you once again for not being silent on important topics, but you have given us a picture of manhood. And Lord, I pray that every man in this room would, would just be encouraged. While there is so much in front of us and that you want us to aspire to, we realize it comes day by day, week by week, month by month. My prayer is that these men would find the strength that you offer all of us. That these men would walk in the wisdom that you offer all of us. And that these men would become the men that do contribute back greatly, especially when it comes to the things that matter in eternity. So Lord, thank you for this morning, for all of us to, to grow as we should, to glorify you in all that's said and done. And we're just so grateful you're our God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you, give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great one.